Hi everyone, this is Miss Ginter. Um, I'm back with another uh, online lecture for you guys. So make sure that you bring your headphones to class. Um, we will be uh, taking some time where you can just plug your headphones in uh, or use your AirPods uh, and that way you can go at your own pace. Um, you will want to make sure you listen to this lecture all the way through and also that you take notes. Um, I didn't really highlight things in red or yellow or anything, um, but I would definitely make sure that if it is in this slide that you understand it and that you write it down. In particular, there will be a lot of key words, so you really want to make sure that you uh, write all that good stuff down. So, um, this is going to be under the persuasion unit, um, and this is called the art of persuasive writing. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to just take some notes and then there are going to be implementation activities in the lecture that I would like you to write down. And I'll let you know when we get to that uh, phase or step and what you need to write down. <clears throat> so this PowerPoint is divided into different sections. So this is part one and this is going to be just a overview. All right, so when writing a persuasive essay, the first thing you want to do is begin with a strong hook. And remember, um, a strong hook is just like you're going fishing. So you have to throw out uh, your fishing wire and then you have to reel uh, the fish in, right? So you want to reel your audience in. Uh, you want to reel the reader in like a fish. So I want you to think about hooks could be facts questions, statistics, and quotes. So they're just some examples. We've written multiple essays in my class at this point, um, but the best way that you can get a reader interested in what you were saying is to start with a hook. After you have that intro, uh, you then move to your thesis. And again, all of this is just in that very first main paragraph. This isn't, you know, your three main points. This is your intro paragraph in a standard five paragraph essay. This would be the little intro paragraph, then you have your three main, uh, and then you have your conclusion. So your thesis statement is a sentence that indicates your position on the topic of your choice, and it should highlight the three main points that later you'll expand on in what I call a ICER, I-C-C-E-R paragraphs, and we're going to kind of go more into that. That's a new term for you is the ICER uh, paragraphs. Again, a thesis is going to have uh, just those three main points and it comes after your intro so you might have a quote and then you have your thesis so let's take a look at what that looks like okay so you are going to want to write each of these terms down but what's that icer paragraph um each of your body paragraphs so that means not the first introduction this is your three main is going to need what's called a icer that stands for introduction counter argument, claim, evidence, and rationale. Hint, hint, okay, uh, you probably need to know what those ICER paragraphs stand for. Introduction, again, that indicates the topic um, as well as your opinion. You need to include a counter argument, so indicate why this opinion is open to debate and offer a refutation to challenge the opposition. Um, refute, that means to kind of set off. So if someone is against abortion, if you're refuting that, you would say, you know, if someone is for, you need to be able to counter the argument. A claim is providing a sentence that your opinion along with your reasoning. So a claim, again, that's a statement that has opinion, but you have to have some type of reason. Remember, you, you know, you just believing it is not enough. Again, that's where we go into evidence that's offering logical, reasonable support for your claim. And you can use things such as facts, <clears throat> expert opinions, questions, stories, anecdotes. And then you need to have rationale, which is expanding on how the provided evidence um, is actually going to make a difference, how that's going to be useful. So you might want to go ahead and pause the video, take some time, and write down those definitions. Again, you'll need to recall what ICCER paragraph ICER stands for. So how do I organize all the research that I have with the main points? So 
the day after we um, do the lecture or somewhere near that, uh, you are going to be completing a argument research graphic organizer. Um, we'll model it. You'll try one example by yourself, and then you'll do one with a partner. So let me go ahead and show you what that looks like. So when you have your research, and we've done this before, but basically you have your claim, which is your thesis, and your three main points. You're going to have your opposing viewpoint. For example, if you're for gun control, or opposite would be someone who's against it. And that says fun. Should be gun. Okay. Um, a rebuttal, again, is another word for counter-argument. How you're going to refute it, that means oppose it. So, um, and basically, we'll, we'll do this in class, but um, you'll have your three main reasons. So those come from your thesis. Um, and then you just will list your facts to support those things. So, you know, if you found information on your first website, and here's your two facts in your second website. Um, so we'll kind of just feel, uh, fill that out. And this is just an example, but again, we'll look more at that in class, um, and hopefully that will be able to help you practice because you're going to have to do a lot of research, obviously, for a persuasive writing essay because persuasion, right, the art of persuasion needs to be based on something other than just, well, because I said so. All right, so you've made it through to part two. Uh, part two is the persuasive writing techniques. There's going to be a lot for you to write down. So again, please pause this as you see fit. And you need to write these down in your notes. All right, so the four uh, top persuasive writing techniques are emotive language, groups of three, rhetorical questions, and facts and statistics. So let's take a look at each of those. Uh, so number one, this is my not very persuasive paragraph. Uh, so let's just take a look at this. Harris's 2 plus 1 diet. Being healthy is important. The 2 plus 1 diet is found in our range of menus. Eat two types of vegetables every day and walk one kilometer. It's a good method. Order now. Okay, well, um, I'm not super persuaded because you're not telling me what types of vegetables I need to eat. And I need to walk uh, a certain amount. Uh, and you're just telling me it's a good method, but you're not really giving me any specifics, right? So to improve that paragraph, the first thing that we could do to improve each of your paragraphs is using emotive language. Uh, these are words that make your reader feel a strong emotion, hint the word emotive. Uh, these are five popular emotive words in English. So we have you, because, love, proven and easy. Those are just simple emotive words that have a lot of uh, empathetical appeal to you. So obviously if you say you, that's making it personal. Because is a reason. Love, love is an, something we feel uh, proven. You're like, oh, I can believe that. Easy. You're like, heck yeah, this is approachable. So here's the new paragraph. The secret to staying healthy is easy. The all-new 2 plus 1 diet is the most popular choice found in our exciting range of menus. All you have to do is eat two types of vegetables every day and walk one kilometer. You will love how simple and easy this proven method is, so order now because you are worth it. They're using each of those words, and now granted guys, you don't have to use um, all of those emotive language words, but you can just pick and choose those. You can see that the paragraph is much stronger. Um, it has all of those elements that we've been talking about. Um, it's giving me something that's a statistic that's proven uh, by telling me that, you know, it's, it's worth it and this is why um, and what you have to do specifically, that it's easy, that it's uh, simple to implement. So I want you in your notes to pause this video and you're going to write two to four sentences trying to persuade your grandmother to buy a smartphone. Um, I want you to use at least five of the following emotive and persuasive words. So you can choose any of these. Uh, I have a bunch, right? We got uh, the ones that we just used in the top row. Uh, but then we have other ones, healthy, confident, guaranteed, never, shocking, cool, revolutionary. You can read the rest of those. Um, so just pause this video. And then when you've completed that activity, you can continue the lecture.
All right, so hopefully you have completed um, activity number one. If you've not completed that, so the last slide, uh, please complete that before going on. So now we're on number two, groups of three. When trying to persuade someone using groups of three words is an easy and proven persuasive technique. We can use adjectives, verbs, adverbs, and nouns to do this. Uh, adjectives are like simple, quick, easy, bold, bright, beautiful. Uh, verbs, okay, actions, chop, fry, serve, stop, drop, and roll. Adverbs, quickly, silently, efficiently. Or just nouns, people, places, things, ideas, bat, ball, glove, salt, pepper, and eggs. Uh, so we're going to practice this again. Here is a paragraph example. Introducing Harris's groundbreaking, innovative, delicious two-in-one diet. See right there, they put those three words, groups of three, to entice us. They're going to do the same thing in their paragraph. The secret to staying healthy is simple, quick, and easy. Our all-new two-in-one diet is the most popular choice found in our affordable, extensive, and exciting range of menus. All you have to do is eat two types of vegetables every day and walk, jog, or run one kilometer. You'll love this proven method, so order now because you are worth it. Again, uh, you are going to pause the video, and this time I want you to edit your sentences from the first activity, persuading your grandmother to buy a smartphone. And this time you're going to add groups of three words. Uh, these are some additional words you can use. You do not have to use these words, but make sure you use groups of three in your own paragraphs. So go ahead and pause the video, and then when you're ready to continue, uh, you can go ahead and start the video again. Now that you've completed step one and two, uh, if you haven't done that, please go back and do that. We are now on step three, rhetorical questions. Another simple proven popular method is when we try to persuade someone to use a rhetorical question. And the thing about a rhetorical question is you're not asking it to get an answer. Uh, it's a question you ask in order to make a point. So for example, how would you feel if your house burnt down? Okay. They're not really asking you to answer that. I'm pretty sure anybody wouldn't feel great if their house burned down, but they're trying to make a point like, wow, that's a really impactful proven question that isn't asking me to answer anything, but it's really making me ponder and think a lot about how I would feel if that happened. So here it is in the same paragraph. Have you tried Harris's amazing new two-in-one diet? What's the secret to staying healthy? The answer is our simple, quick, and easy new two-in-one diet. It's definitely the most popular choice found in our affordable, extensive, and exciting range of menus. All you have to do is eat two types of vegetables every day and walk, jog, or run one kilometer. You will love this proven method, so what are you waiting for? Order now, because you are worth it. In uh, the yellow, those are rhetorical questions. They're not really asking you to answer what are you waiting for or the secret to staying healthy. Uh, they're like, hey, here's a question that's going to make me think, wow, that has a difference or impact on my life. And then they are filling that in with their solution. So your turn. Again, pause the video. This is step three of four. You're going to edit your sentences persuading your grandma to buy a smartphone. And I would just rewrite this under step three. You're going to add rhetorical questions. And these are just some possible question starters you could use. You can make up your own, but these are just some. Such as imagine if, what would happen if, why are there, how easy do you think, just examples. Again, pause the video, go ahead and do step three. So we've made it to step four. If you haven't done steps one through three, please go back and do steps one through three. Again, I will be checking these in your notes, so you want to make sure that you do those. Your fourth way is uh, persuading people with facts and statistics. This is probably the final one that is really effective to convince a reader. So I suggest that you try it if you're really struggling. Um, the reason this is effective is because people believe people that aren't you. Uh, and they believe people that aren't me. They believe people that have credentials and PhDs and doctorates. Um, so these are just some random facts and statistics. Um, and these ones have to do with uh, weight or healthy eating. So if you tell someone, well, one in every four teenagers is overweight in Australia, that's definitely going to make an impact. Or most nutritionists would recommend we fill half our dinner plate with fruits and veggies. Um, those are people that know what they're talking about and the statistics make a difference and a great impact that want to lead you to change. 
So in this paragraph, um, all they did was implement the same thing in the yellow. So they added over 1.5 million, uh, two types of vegetables run one kilometer, half an hour of each time up to 10 years for your life. So they're saying, you know, if you just spend 30 minutes exercising and eating two types of vegetables and walking one kilometer every day, uh, that you're going to add up to 10 years in your life. Um, so in this next example, uh, you are going to be doing the same thing. And again, this goes with, they decided to say that it had a 98% success rate. So finally, you're going to write a final version of your paragraph. And it needs to have some facts and statistics. Again, you're writing about, uh, you're convincing your reader okay, to buy a smartphone. And this is your grandma. So you are writing this to grandma. Uh, my grandma has a smartphone and she... Uh, I love her to death, but she doesn't know a lot of what she's doing. So um, I'm going to pretend that, you know, I'm trying to persuade my grandma to buy a smartphone and how would I have to communicate her to get her to understand? Because, you know, elderly people or older people, um, no matter how old your grandparents are, usually have a little bit of difficulty with electronics. So think about who your audience is um, and then just make up some facts and statistics that you want to use to persuade them. So you'll need to pause the video. And you'll need to complete those four activities in your notes. And again, then I'll be checking those um, when we are finished. Welcome back. Hopefully you have finished those four activities. Make sure that you have those in your notes. If you do not, please do not continue this video. You need to go back and do those first before you keep going. But if you have, congratulations, you've made it to part three. Uh, this is forms of persuasive writing. The forms that we're going to be talking about are advertisements, editorials, speeches, propaganda, reviews, blogs, and persuasive essays. You guys are writing persuasive essays. Uh, so I heard about Miss Betty White uh, passing away uh, right before uh, 2022. Um, I believe that was December 31st, 2021. Everyone was really sad uh, that she passed away. But here is Miss Betty White. This is the Snickers uh, advertisement. And advertisements are trying to convince you to do or buy something. So using Betty White as a iconic person that a lot of people relate to. A lot of people like Snickers bars, uh, saying you're not yourself when you're angry. Um, so if you use an advertisement, it can really convince your audience to do or buy something. Editorials are usually about current issues, and they can be in the newspaper, a magazine, TV, radio, or the internet. These are just some popular editorials. Persuasive speeches try to convince the audience to take action. Um, and obviously this is Martin Luther King Jr., super influential man uh, with persuasive speeches. We'll actually look at a couple speeches uh, throughout the class. Usually we look at Martin Luther King, we look at um, John F. Kennedy, we look at some kids that have done speeches. And again, you'll need to know all these terms, so I would make sure that you pause the video, go back, write these down if you need to. Propaganda is super popular every year when we have elections, so usually about political issues. It has an emotionally charged appeal, so Obama, a change we can believe in, um, or uh, this president is saying, miss me yet? Um, and so usually when we use propaganda, people can get a bit snarky. Uh, we see a lot of bashing of political parties, not encouraging you to do that. That's not the effective method. Uh, but even in like cartoons in the newspaper, we see a lot of political cartoons and propaganda is highly effective. That's why if people use it. It doesn't mean that it's the nicest thing to do, but it is effective. Reviews. So a few of you did this when you chose your final book reading project. Um, and if we haven't done that in this class yet, uh, you'll eventually find out when we do that. But reviews are just evaluating things like books or movies and you have an opinion and why why or why not something is worth the money. Uh, this one's from IMDb uh, on the movie Brave. But I mean, some of you could look at reviews for your books that you've read. Uh, I've looked at movie reviews before or after I go see something to see if it's going to be worth my time uh, or after it to see, oh, did other people see that that was a horrible movie? Uh, is it just me? Blogs. Okay, so I have a blog and um, 
blogs have commentary on a particular topic, so they usually combine text, images, and links to other blogs or web pages, media related to a topic, and they have uh, a space for readers to respond. So when we typically look at blogs, um, like my blog is faith-based, so I write a lot about my Christian faith, and um, I provide space for people to give feedback about what they want to write about. They can leave comments kind of similar to this formatting. Uh, maybe I'll link some videos. Maybe I have where people s subscribe. Um, I have my YouTube cha channel related topics and ideas. So blogs are uh, good resources uh, unless they're from Wikipedia. Uh, again, <laughs> never use Wikipedia, especially in persuasive writing. Finally, persuasive essays. This is what you guys are going to use. Um, you use persuasive essays to convince readers to join a writer in a certain point of view. So you're using logic, reason, and emotion. That's where we're going to talk about logos, ethos, pathos, to convince them to join you in a certain point of view. Again, like for or against gun control, for or against abortion, uh, for or against whatever you see fit, a healthy diet, exercise, something interesting to you. And part four, we are on the persuasive essay. Again, any of these, um, you probably should write down. A lot of this is repetitive because I'm really trying to get in your brains the importance of a persuasive essay convincing a reader to agree with your opinion. And you have to use this formatting uh, or it's not going to be persuasive. It's not going to be effective. It's not going to work. First, again, is that leader hook. We're going to just capture the attention you want. You know, the beginning of a movie has to be something that's interesting. The first few pages of a book have to be interesting. First few sentences of your essay have got to be pivotal, monumental. They've got to get me interested. You know, if I see a store and from the outside it looks really boring, I'm not going to go inside. But if it catches my eye, there's something in the window. Okay, that's what you're doing. Again, your thesis is going to state your belief. And you have to have supporting arguments. And we're going to talk about logos, pathos, and ethos again. Just to review those to convince me of something. It's recommended that you use counter arguments. So again... If you're for something that you address, well, some people might say they're against, however, you need to review it back to you and then conclude. So restate the thesis. Okay, so these are um, some extra ways that we could lead or hook people in. I know that we just looked at a bunch of ideas from like emotions to facts, statistics, and rhetorical questions, um, but here are some additional ways. So an antidote is, a lot of you ask me what this means, it's a narrative, okay? Narrative uh, vignette. And so this is something that paints a picture or a story and gets us interested. So I walked proudly through the hallways of AMS, my new blue mohawk glistening magnificently in the fluorescent lighting of the hallway. But then I saw Mr. Caruthers. I felt the wax in my hair start to melt. So this is just showing us where somebody's at in the beginning of their story. Feel free to paint me a picture. You can use a question. Hyperbole, remember an extreme exaggeration. For the past 300 years, okay, not really, uh, but they're exaggerating. You know, we've been crushing artistic freedom with students with oppressive dress codes. Setting, you could, you know, really set the scene kind of like a interview or reporter. At Centerville Middle School, a controversy is brewing walk down the hallways and amidst a tranquil sea of khaki pants and navy, navy, navy blue polo shirts, the blades of a fuchsia mohawk cut through the peaceful learning environment. So setting the scene. You can give alliteration. Remember that's what occurs when you use the same start at the beginning of every word. Uh, timeless, tasteful, tried and true. Or give me a quote, give me liberty or give me death. Again, these are leads, hook, leads or hooks you can use to grab the reader's attention. And again, that hook comes before your thesis. A thesis and forecast. Uh, forecast is another kind of word for that. So a thesis statement is always one sentence that states your belief about a topic, and you have to include a forecast. That's your three main points. Here's a really basic, 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 basic uh, form of thesis. I believe blank because, and then one, two, three. So I believe that diet and healthy exercise are important for young adults because and then we would list three reasons so maybe i want to say because 
Um, it increases the average lifespan. Uh, it enables students to have better uh, mental health and it improves their spiritual life or something like that. And I would use each of those three main things to expand upon in each main body paragraph. Now this is just kind of what that looks like. So again, we have our intro and thesis and some of you are probably like wanting to bang your head on the desk because I keep saying the same thing, but there will be some of you that still don't do this. So really, really want to get this clear. Um, you have to have your intro. Okay, however you're going to do that. And then your thesis. That's the same that we just talked about. Then you're going to have your first argument, your first main point. You have to have the support for that to back it up. So that's where you're going to have your research and integrate your research. Then your second one, same thing. Third, same thing. Then you're going to conclude. Um, and again, through all of this, you want to use logos, ethos, and pathos. So your logical, your ethical, your emotional. So if we take a look at these, um, which of the following is a good thesis statement? So go ahead and just pause the video, read through these, and tell me, uh, you know, maybe on your piece of paper, which of these is a good thesis statement. Okay, so if we look at this, um, the first one, you know, I believe we must stop wasting food now. Uh, that is a belief, but you're not really telling me why. The second one, the problem of food waste can easily be solved by implementing the three simple steps, reduce, reuse, recycle. Sounds pretty good, but let's still check. Um, if you aren't reducing, reusing, recycling, you should. Well, you know, I think that they are giving me three main points but it sounds a little too informal for a persuasive essay. And this last one that I'm not gonna read you, um, that is way too much going on. Remember that a intro, you know, you can have a sentence, but your thesis has to be one sentence. One, not three, not two, not seven, one. One sentence. They have way too much stuff going on up here. They're telling me you need to reduce food and they're giving me examples and they're giving me more examples. like. They're still not giving me three main points. Um, so again, one that is the most concise and clear and evident of information of highlighting the three points, definitely gonna be uh, number two. So there's a problem and you were telling me how to solve that problem through three easy steps, which will be three main points. So here's where we're gonna review your supporting arguments. You got your logos, ethos, and pathos, logos logical. This means, does the author's proposal make sense? So when you are reviewing your evidence through your research, think, does their proposal make sense? If they're making a point that has no evidence and makes no sense, please don't use that as evidence or you're just going to make yourself sound silly. Your ethos is the author's proposal the right thing to do. Remember, this has to do with your ethics, okay? If you are against abortion you don't really want to use an article that's probably saying why abortion is a good thing um, you need something that's going to appeal to the ethical emotions of the right thing whatever that right thing is for you and for the majority of the readers that you're writing towards your audience and pathos is you know the emotional um will accepting the author's proposal make you feel better so again those are just three main questions i would ask yourself while doing research So we have some different types of supporting arguments for each of these. So here's the Logos um, logic. Call your doctor today to see if this medication is right for you. Um, a logical appeal is going to have a testimony from an expert. So this is a doctor, a user of this product. It's going to have stats. So right there it has some statistical information. It's going to have that the product is the logical or right choice. That's why it says to see if it's right for you. They're not claiming it's right for everyone, but they are claiming that it's right for some people. Ethos. Here we go. This is Mr. Captain America. So we got ethos is the appeal to do the right thing. Um, this was really common during the wartime. I want you for the U.S. Army, nearest recruiting station, and then Captain America. Again, the ethos uh, is different than logos because logos is your logic. That's an expert testimony. A ethos is just the right thing. Like, what is the right thing to do? What is right versus wrong? 
And then here we go, the super sad uh, pathos. That's your emotions. The horrible ASPCA arms of an angel commercial where I have to turn off the TV every time it's on because, you know, just trying to guilt trip you into donating money. Um, so pathos, again, is those emotions. And it's not always sad either. It can make you feel different things, but this is just the most prominent example. And like I said, they're not always sad. So in the got milk, uh, they're trying to use a popular figure to get you to drink more milk uh, and buy milk. And then this is just a funny one. This is for six flags, more flags, more fun. Again, emotional arguments. So pathos uh, can be the, any type of emotion. So you definitely need to know the difference between logos, logic, ethos, your right thing to do, and pathos, your emotions. You have to know those definitions. Counter arguments address reader objections. So um, here are some examples of counter arguments. Oil companies should not be allowed to drill for oil in Alaska. And then schools should make overweight students eat diet meals for school lunch. So I want you to pause the video and I want you to go ahead and write down a counter argument for each of these. So you're going to write the opposite of oil companies should not be allowed to drill for oil. So you should be telling me some reason why they should be. Make sure you give me a reason why. And then give me the opposite of school should make overweight students eat diet meals for school lunch. So go ahead and take a moment, pause the video, and write me a counter argument for each of those. So hopefully you've written a good counter argument for each of those. Um, but again, if you were telling me oil companies should be allowed to drill, you'd have to give me some type of specific reason. Maybe, you know, Alaska is in desperate need and 75% of homes are without resources for heat or something very specific that takes oil. Um, and then schools should make overweight students eat diet meals for school lunch. Um, that's not very nice. So maybe you want to say that schools uh, should make healthy meal options available for all students or something like that that opposes it. So just want to make sure that you know how to do a counter argument and you have to have some type of specific reasoning. So in that case, you know, they should make healthy lunches available to all students so that um, individuals have a healthy choice at lunch to enable them to live a healthy lifestyle. All right, finally, we have reached almost the end. Uh, in conclusion and restating the thesis and commentary. Uh, these are examples from... Uh, very popular speeches. Uh, we will actually be looking at Martin Luther King Jr. speech a little bit more in depth. Um, but this is kind of, if you just look at this, it's saying 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the monocles of segregation, the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of the vast ocean of material prosperity. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but he just keeps repeating 100 years, 100 years. Uh, same thing with freedom ring. Um, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Um, when you have a conclusion in your own essay, you need to reiterate your three main points. Okay, that means you need to restate it in brand new words. Do not take the exact sentence from your first paragraph intro and slap it in there. Okay, it needs to be rewritten. Okay, so uh, what I want you to do is we have one more slide, and or I think we do. Um, and what I want you to do is I want you to think about the audience and the author's purpose for, you know, whatever your topic might be that you are writing about. I want you to think about who you're writing towards. Obviously, I'm the one grading it, but, you know, if you're writing your paper about for gun control, you need to think about people that you can get on your side to be for gun control. If you're against abortion, who would you be writing towards that's against abortion? Maybe, you know, expecting mothers or people that you want to persuade that are thinking about abortions. So when writing persuasively, you always need to remember the interaction between the writer and the reader. You as a writer, you're trying to persuade a reader who may be enthusiastic or resistant or just not interested at all in what you're writing. So, you know, again, if you're writing towards someone about why abortion is wrong, um, and I keep using that just because that's a really common example that students will write about that they can find a lot of research on or maybe they're passionate about, but you have to persuade a reader that you know, sometimes they're going to be excited. They're going to be with you. They're going to be in agreement that, yeah, like, I really agree with them that, like, that is the main point. 
Um, but there's also going to be people who are going to stand there with their hands on their hips and they're going to glare at you and they're going to say, heck no, like you're not going to persuade me. So your persuasive writing needs to be organized and it also has to have the hook to keep us engaged and not just at the beginning, but then you need to continually keep me interested all the way through the essay. You need to use authentic words. That means don't use big words if you don't normally use big words. Just be yourself. Talk as you would talk. Okay, now that doesn't mean you sing slang and B dash C. Okay, I want full words. Um, but you need to be real. Okay, don't try to tell me that you're for something if you're really against it. You need to be uh, transparent and open about your opinion, but also keep me engaged with creative and authentic word choices and emotions in the way that you choose to persuade your audience. All right, so we have finally reached the end of this PowerPoint. Um, I know that that was a lot. Your brains are probably overflowing with information. You want to make sure that you have taken notes thoroughly on this. You are going to be taking a quiz. So um, you will be taking a quiz on this, and you have to have taken notes, uh, completed the activities that I told you to practice. Um, and then in class, we're going to be doing that argument research graphic organizer. Uh, I'll be giving you packets, hopefully, that you already have, or I am going to give to you. Uh, with your outlines and how to do all that good stuff, like the thesis, the hook, the ICER paragraphs. Um, again, you need to know what an ICER paragraph is. Probably also need to know the definitions, a logo, ethos, pathos, be able to give me some examples. So if you guys have any questions, as always, feel free to reach out to me um, on my email uh, or just come see me. So I hope you guys have a great day and let me know if you need anything. Bye.